Welcome back, my sleepy nights. My name is Kevin, and tonight we'll wander through fantasy lands and pleasant wizard dreams as we embark on a journey to Hogwarts. You step through the magical archway leading on to platform nine and three quarters. Heart hammering with excitement. This is the moment you've been waiting for. The chance to finally escape your dreary life at the orphanage and embrace your destiny as a young witch. Clutching your Hogwarts acceptance letter, you gaze around in wonder at the scarlet steam engine waiting to whisk you away to a new world. You drag your battered trunk onto the train and begin searching for an empty compartment. Most are already full of chatting students reconnecting after the summer. Finally, you find one at the very end, occupied only by a round-faced boy. Mind if I join you? You ask. Everywhere else is full. The boy looks up eagerly. Not at all. I'm Nigel. You smile and introduce yourself. Stowing your trunk before sitting down. As the train whistles and lurches into motion, you and Nigel talk about how exciting and nervous you both feel starting at Hogwarts. My gran wasn't sure I had enough magic to get in, Nigel admits. Little stuff would happen around me sometimes, but not as much as in most wizarding families. She was worried I might be a squib. You assure him you know nothing of magic yet, either. Having grown up in a dreary muggle orphanage. Nigel seems to be relieved he's not the only apprehensive first year. Outside the windows, cityscapes give way to green fields as you speed farther north. You buy treats off the trolley cart and share them with Nigel, your new friend. The sky is dark when the train finally rolls to a stop at Hogsmeade Station. You follow the giant groundskeeper Magnus down a winding path with the other first years to a vast lake's shore. There, a fleet of small boats awaits to ferry you across the shimmering black water towards the distant glittering lights of Hogwarts Castle. As the boats glide smoothly forward, an odd hush falls over the students. None of you have ever seen anything one-tenth so beautiful or grand in your lives. Inside the carnivorous entrance hall, stern deputy headmistress, Professor Iona, explains about the four Hogwarts houses. 
Gryffindor, Slytherin, Ravenclaw, and Hufflepuff. While here, your house will be like your family, she informs you briskly. Your heart hammers as Professor Iona leads you into the candlelit great hall to be sorted under the ancient wizard's hat. One by one, first years are called up to sit on the rickety stool before the hat announces their new house. Nigel is called. You cross your fingers as he stumbles up apprehensively. After a pause, the hat proclaims Gryffindor to loud cheers from the Gryffindor table. Nigel shoots you a relieved grin before joining his new housemates. At last, your own name rings out. Artemis. Taking a deep breath, you walk shakily forth and lower the frayed hat onto your head. After a moment, a small voice whispers mysteriously into your thoughts. Hmm. Cunning and ambition, balanced by a hidden kindness. You shall do well in Slytherin. Grinning excitedly, you hurry to the emerald and silver draped Slytherin table, proudly taking your place among the cheering students under the green banners bearing the serpent emblem. Looking around at the animated faces surrounding you, for the first time, you feel truly like you belong somewhere. This will be your home as the start of term feast appears suddenly on golden plates up and down the tables. You dig in hungrily to the sumptuous fare, the likes of which you've never seen before. The ghost of the bloody baron pauses behind you, chuckling oddly. Welcome, young serpent, he rasps, before continuing his patrols down the table. You chat eagerly with the Slytherin prefects about your classes and professors. Already, Potions Master Severus Gray sounds very intimidating. After the feast concludes with decadent puddings, the prefects lead you down to the drafty dungeons and through a concealed stone door behind a tapestry into the Slytherin common room. Green glass lamps and a crackling fireplace make the underground space feel cosy and inviting. The plush black leather sofas and high backed chairs offer a comfortable place to relax or study. Through the thick glass windows set at ground level, you glimpse faint green light rippling from the lake's depths just beyond. The girl's dormitory lies at the base of a twisting stone staircase winding down even deeper underground. Inside the elegant room, you find your battered trunk waiting beside one of your four poster beds. 
its luxurious emerald curtains closed. Too excited to sleep yet, you chatter quietly with your new housemates whilst unpacking your few possessions. Hogwarts already feels more like home than anywhere you've ever lived before. You can't wait to begin lessons tomorrow morning. The first week leaves you dizzy, trying to learn the castle's eccentric geography and avoid its trick stairs and false doors, but you eagerly tackle every new magical class. Diminutive Charms Master Professor Flickwick teaches you to make objects hover and fly using the Wingardium Leviosa spell. You succeed on your first try, proudly making your feathers soar all the way to the ceiling, and even earning five points for Slytherin. However, transfiguration proves more difficult to understand Professor Iona's gaze and you accidentally singe your desktop, morphing a match into a needle. Do take care to not let your raw talents run wild, yes? Iona remarks with a thin smile. Your lessons continue with herbology in the greenhouses History of Magic, lectured by ghostly Professor Binns, and defense against the dark arts, your favorite subject so far. But you long for Thursday afternoons most of all, when flying lessons with Madam Flight commence. As you soar over the Quidditch pitch, you feel your first taste of true freedom, like a bird released from a cage. During those brief moments aloft, all your worries and sense of not belonging melt away. Despite your enthusiasm for classes, your occasional erratic bursts of untamed magic grow more frequent throughout the term. Objects unexpectedly shatter, or papers ignite when your emotions run high. The unsettling episodes leave you shaken, and fill the professor's eyes with unease. You hope desperately someone here can teach you to control these frightening powers, threatening to overwhelm you. But how can you ask for help when you barely understand them yourself? The first term flies by in a blur of magical discoveries. Before you even know it, Christmas holidays are fast approaching. Most students eagerly discuss their holiday plans, but your heart sinks, realizing you have nowhere to go as an orphan. When sign-up sheets are posted by students for staying through the break, you add your name with a pang of envy as your friends chatter about the long-awaited family reunions and celebrations. On the final evening before the Hogwarts Express returns to London, melancholy drives you to wander the echoing corridors alone, with only the ghosts for company. Most of the portraits call out cheerfully early Christmas greetings as you pass, 
but you only nod politely, preoccupied with brooding thoughts. Your aimless steps eventually carry you to the library. Your refuge from the aching loneliness you've battled since childhood. Among the dusty stacks and leather bound tombs, you find familiar comfort. Curling in a window nook with a heavy spell book, Try focusing on its aged pages, but reading cannot distract you for long from the creeping emptiness settling around your heart as snow falls steadily outside the foggy glass. You know once the other students depart in the morning the isolation here will feel suffocating. These bleak thoughts cling like gathering cobwebs until faint music reaches your ears. The gentle, melancholy notes of a piano. Drawn by these soothing sounds, you set your book aside to investigate, wandering through the shadowy shelves towards the sound. It leads you to a cosy corner you've never explored before. With a crackling fireplace, surrounded by plush armchairs and sofas. In one corner sits a handsome grand piano, where a student with a prefix badge embroidered on his robe plays a soft, lingering holiday song. Glancing up in surprise at your approach, the older boy gives a kind smile. Bit lonely tonight, he asks gently. When you nod, he scoots down the piano bench in invitation. Then come listen if you'd like. The holidays can be a rough time for those who feel alone. You gratefully accept, settling into a chair near the piano as the hopeful music washes over you. The boy introduces himself as Felix, a Ravenclaw sixth year. He explains not all students have a welcoming place to go for the holidays or family who understands them. But Hogwarts still provides a home for those willing to create their own traditions. You nod, deeply comforted to feel less alone in your melancholy. You sit listening to Felix play until you nearly doze off right there in the plush chair. And he graciously walks you back to your dormitory for the night. You thank him sincerely. At least one person here seems to understand. The next morning you bid goodbye to your friend, wishing them happy holidays as they depart for the train. The castle seems to exhale deeply as peace settles over its now mostly empty halls and corridors. You take your meals with Felix and a handful of other students staying behind at a single table in the carnivorous Great Hall. Though you miss your new friends, you fill the lonely days flying endlessly on the vacant Quidditch pitch glorying in the rare gift of solitude, and each evening you return to the cosy hidden den to relax by the fire as Felix plays his piano music long into the winter nights. For the first time 
you understand what it feels like to have a place called home. But the peaceful holiday interlude cannot last indefinitely. A few mornings before the rest of the students are due to return for the next term, you awaken early from another bout of troubled sleep. Lately your dreams seem to grow more vivid and disturbing every night, featuring haunting visions of blood, screams and shadowy figures pursuing you through the castle's dark corridors. You try brushing out the uneasy images off as just stress-fueled nightmares brought on by the massive changes in your life. But you can't ignore the deep sense that they are something more than mere figments of anxiety. Unable to fall back asleep, you dress and make your way down to the great hall for an early breakfast. Only a few other students and professors are about and awake this early. You sip your tea slowly, trying in vain to shake off the grim melancholy clinging to you from those unsettling dreams. But you cannot suppress the lingering feeling of dread they sparked. Pain. Pain suddenly explodes across your forehead near your temple. A searing agony unlike anything you've experienced before. With a gasp you double over, clamping both hands over the sores. It feels as if a hot spike is being driven right between your eyes. Through watering eyes you glimpse the teachers rushing over in alarm. Professor Gray reaches you first gripping your shoulders with urgent concern. What's wrong? He demands, scanning your face closely. Unable to form words through the haze of pain, Professor Gray's already grave face pales further at the sight of you. Come with me at once, he orders tersely, already steering you firmly from the hall. There are matters we must discuss. Professor Gray leads you swiftly through the empty torch-lit corridors to his office in the dungeons. You sink gratefully into a chair by his desk. Gray paces before you, his expression deeply troubled. I suspected the truth when you first arrived here, he mutters half to himself now. Your natural talents, it makes terrible sense to me now. He fixes you with an intense scare. What do you know of the dark Lord Voldemort? Confused and unsettled by the professor's urgent gravity around this wizard who seems only a grim legend, very little, only that he was an evil sorcerer who tried to take over the magical world years ago. But he was destroyed somehow, wasn't he? Grey nods slowly, face etched with grim sorrow. Supposedly destroyed, though at great cost. But his followers believe Voldemort will one day return to finish what he began. He kneels before your chair, expression grave. I believe that you are an heir of Salazar Slytherin. You stare at him, struggling to comprehend the implications of what he's revealing. An heir of 
Slytherin. But then I would have to be... Yes, Grey confirms quietly. You bear traces of Voldemort's own bloodline within you. You go cold all over. His terrible words hitting you like a brutal slap. The murderous sorcerer from your nightmares, the darkest wizard in history, shares your lineage. Is that why you've always harbored strange abilities? Overwhelmed, you clutch at your forehead again. No, I'm nothing like him, you choke out piercely. But Grey regards you with only grim pity and regret in his eyes. Not yet, but his spirit somehow influences you, which might grow only if unchecked. He squeezes your shoulder bracingly, though his voice remains solemn. I cannot pretend this is not a grave burden to bear, but we will help you carry it and forge your own destiny. That night your sleep grows fractured and fightful. Plagued by vivid nightmares you now recognize as Voldemort's own memories, bleeding into your vulnerable psyche. They hint at ancient secrets and abilities waiting to be unlocked within you. You withdraw from friends and avoid their invitations, wanting to protect them from the darkness you now carry. Delving into the shadowed library archives, you pour tirelessly over history texts about Voldemort's rise and fall from power desperately seeking answers about your true lineage and purpose. The accounts chill your blood, forcing you to question how easily you could follow the same destructive path, consumed by the same obsession with unlocking the full powers of your shared bloodline. These dangerous reflections trouble you deeply but you confide your fears in no one, determined to handle the burden alone. The strange compulsion stirring within you since your arrival at Hogwarts feel like yours to bear solitary. You grow withdrawn, turning down offers from classmates to study or spend time together. At night you wander the empty castle alone, Lost in brooding thoughts, your only company the ghosts drifting past on their undoable errands. During one such aimless midnight walk weeks later, you chance to pass by Professor Iona's office door, and you overhear urgent voices within. Despite your better judgment, you pause, curiosity overpowering caution. The child is clearly unstable, comes Professor Gray's strained voice. I warned Albus she is not ready for Hogwarts with so little control, but he refused to listen. Professor Iona sighs heavily. What would you have us do instead? She has nowhere else to go. And her talents will only grow more wild and dangerous without proper schooling. You know as well as I the hidden dangers should her lineage become known. Grey replies darkly. She must learn restraint 
before the echoes of Voldemort's legacy fully consumes her. Staggered, you reel away from the office door, their words piercing your heart like a blade. So they have already judged you unstable, vowed to restrain and contain you. They understand nothing. You've harmed no one. Blood pounds hotly in your ears as you storm away blindly. How dare they presume to decide your fate? Whisper what you may one day become. You are not Voldemort. You will forge your own destiny. No matter what shackles they try to bind with you. You have only glimpsed the well of power simmering within you. Soon enough, all of Hogwarts will witness it too. The year concludes with a grand feast where Slytherin banners celebrate your house winning the House Cup. But you take no joy in the celebration. Fixated on the wary glances the professors cast your way. Let them be weary. Soon none will stop you from unlocking your true potential no matter the cost. At last you make your way down to the train bound for London along with the other students. But you hardly notice the passing hills and valleys consumed by thoughts of the coming summer and fall. This was only your first year at Hogwarts, an introduction. When you return, the real work will begin in earnest. Work not even the teachers can oversee. Back at the Dingy Wolves Orphanage, you spend the empty months secreted away rereading your spellbooks. Impatient to practice magic freely again. At night, your twisted dreams grow even more vivid, hinting at ancient secrets waiting to be unearthed if you delve deeper than ever before. Voldemort's cold voice echoes through, promising you have only glimpsed the surface of the power flowing in your shared blood. The 1st of September finally arrives. You depart for King's Cross eagerly, leaving the grim orphanage behind without a backward glance. As the scarlet engine carries you north, you sit alone absorbed in an old spell book about obscure curse magic, thoughts turned only to the deepening mysteries awaiting back at Hogwarts. There will be time for idle friendships again later. For now, your restless mind seeks only revelation. The start of Tam Feast passes in a blur of sounds and smells. Back in your drafty dungeon dormitory, you bid your housemates only a curt goodnight before slipping off alone to the library. Among the shadowy shelves and aisles, you search for any book on ancient ruins or prophecy. So the weeks pass in relentless research. During classes you play the model student, attentive, reserved, ambitious. The professors believe you tamed and content. But each free hour finds you delving deeper into obscure magic, far from their supervision. You begin practicing all your growing skills on portraits and ghosts, 
probing deeper into their centuries of memories, seeking hints about lost founder artifacts. Your quest leads you to forgotten passages deep below the castle, to secretly practice divination spells considered borderline dark. Sheltered from meddling eyes, you are free to tap into your deeper magical intuition in ways never allowed in textbooks or classroom. Rumours eventually spread through the student body of a shadowy figure glimpsed drifting silently through the corridors at night, when all should be asleep. No one can provide more than a fleeting account, but uneasy speculation spreads that this unknown spectre has crept unusually close to the castle's heart. Even the ghosts grow disturbed by this interloper treading ancient halls undisturbed. The professors increase patrols and security wards, but all attempts to glimpse the intruder directly fail. Privately, you revel in how rapidly fearful imagination fans the unease sparked by your nighttime wanderings. Let them speculate and dread. When the time comes to publicly announce your presence, their minds will already be primed to accept the new order you represent. Fear of the unknown opens far from minds and persuasion alone. One moonless midnight finds you ascending silently to the astronomy tower. The icy wind sighing around you, a forbidding scrying orb stolen from the ministry rests securely beneath your robes, a relic you intend to activate under the open sky for your own designs. But as you mount the final steps to the tower top, a lone silhouette stands already waiting there. You freeze, every muscle tensing, but then the figure turns, hands raised peacefully, and you recognize the kind face of Myrtle, a Ravenclaw girl from your portion's class. She gazes at you sadly, making no move to flee or raise an alarm. Wait, she says softly, I know what you plan and the path you follow, but it doesn't have to be this way. Myrtle takes a slow step forward, her voice imploring, your gifts could help so many. Instead of control them through fear, it's never too late to turn from this break. Heaving the stolen orb tighter beneath your cloak, you stand frozen, uncertain of how to respond. But Myrtle presses on gently. I don't know what darkness haunts you, but we've heard the whispers of who you could become. Please. Help me wake the others to choose a better dream than this. She extends a hand, a pleading, trembling hand. For several taut heartbeats, a fragile bridge stands stretched out between you, framed by the silent stars. You stare down at her offer. Tempting, and yet so naive. Myrtle gazes back unwaveringly, 
her eyes full of compassion. In another life, perhaps you could have reached out and taken her hand, but not tonight. The others will awaken soon enough, you reply finally, softly. But perhaps not to the dream you hope for. In one smooth motion, you draw your wand and train it upon Myrtle's vulnerable form. Now, I suggest you return to your bed while you still can. The unspoken threat in your low tone sparks her survival instinct. With a choked grasp, Myrtle spins and flees for the stairs without looking back. The shadow door slams heavily behind her, leaving only you and the sighing wind. Gripping your wand tighter, you turn to gaze upwards at the waiting stars. Myrtle's naive intervention changes nothing. The next phase begins as planned at moonrise. Come morning light, screams and shouts of shock echo all corners of the castle. All awaken to find an identical silver serpent symbol now seared by ancient ruins into the stone above their beds. None can erase or conceal these watching sigils. Panic races unchecked through the halls at this chilling violation. Both a demonstration of power and a promise of retribution. Terrified students convene emergency gatherings, huddle together for protection as they heatedly debate how to address this act of psychological terrorism. Even the professors stand mute and dismayed, incapable of offering either explanations or reassurance. That all will remain unchanged. Your unseen hand has wounded the castle at its very heart and left your indelible mark upon it. Privately, you revel in this carefully orchestrated dread spreading. No concessions or tightened security can satisfy them now. The only possible remedy is to weave yourself fully into the school's fabric, then reshape it entirely according to your design from within. Their imaginations have perfectly primed them to accept the necessity of what you represent. Let their fears swell to ripeness. The rituals prepared will soon provide a fitting demonstration of the power their whispered prophecies speak of. Patience. The appointed hour approaches. Once the full moon grants you unchecked communion with spirits eager to herald this new era at your side, all remaining doubts will finally be purged in cleansing flame. Events now move beyond any force within the castle to divert. Where before you were but a shadow, all will soon be forced to reckon with the blazon icon your incomplete destiny demands you now become. The rituals prepared will pave the way. Let the rotting world await its overdue reckoning. You sweep swiftly through the moonlit forest dry leaves and twigs cracking beneath your boots. The 
chill night air carries the scent of coming winter, but you hardly feel the cold. The ancient text, cradled carefully in your arm, radiates as a subtle warmth, as if sensing its purpose nears completion. At last, you arrive in the remote grove chosen for tonight's work and pause. This neglected place should serve you well, far from the castle and any prying intervention. Kneeling reverently, you lay the heavy book in the center of the leaf-strewn clearing and open it to the paged mark with a black ribbon. An ancient ritual to summon spirits and bargain for their power. Meticulously, you inscribe a wide circle around the book using a silver ritual dagger copying the elaborate ruins and signals from memory. The necessary words in place. You stand and retrieve one more item from within your cloak. A palm-sized crystal orb, cupping a writhing shadow essence bound long ago by forces unknown. Setting the now pulsing crystal sphere carefully within the circle's heart. You raise your left hand high and draw the dagger's cold edge across your exposed palm without hesitation. Hot blood wells and drips down onto the thirsty earth. A freely given sacrifice to rouse what slumbers below. Gripping your wand in your pleading hand, you repeat the rhythmic invocation transcribed on the yellowed pages, voice rising powerfully over the ancient silent trees. As the incantation reaches its climax, Crimson light suddenly erupts from the crystal artifact, the blood offering igniting a reaction from the vengeful spirit imprisoned within. You repeat the summoning words once more, raw magic crackling through the electrified air. Then with a final thunderous command, in the ancient tongue, you smash your wand down upon the crystal orb resting among the glyphs. The sphere shatters violently beneath the blow, shards exploding outward in a blast that knocks you physically backwards as a shadowy vapor rapidly unfurls from the broken vessel. The unbound spirit manifests fully within the ritual circle. Pale and skeletal, crimson eyes ablaze within a face that makes your very soul recoil in horror. And yet despite that dread, your heart pounds with triumph. After so many years, Lord Voldemort rises again. Well done, my young heir. The apparition rasps, the sinister voice clawing along your spine as he examines his newly constructed form. At last, we stand united beyond grasp of the fools who hope to keep us apart. Voldemort paces closer with predatory grace, scrutinizing you hungrily. And 
I see you have indeed grown powerful, ripe with potential to be molded further to my design. His lipless mouth twists in malevolent anticipation. Yes, I do believe you are finally ready to serve as the vessel to restore my full glory. With sudden viper swiftness, Voldemort's spirit lunges forward before you can react, surging into your body in a tsunami of scouring dark power. Blinding pain wipes out all thought as you feel his parasitic essence invade every cell, ruthlessly scouring your mind and soul to make room for his own. You are only distantly aware of your raw screams, carrying through the icy night air. Never have you felt such all-consuming agony as Voldemort's fractured but ravenous spirit quests through your yielding body like a plague. But deep in your crumbling psyche, some flicker of defiance yet smolders. With the last scrap of your strength, you grasp that fragile lifeline. Can't give in. Never wanted this. Must fight. That glimmer kindles into a faint inner light, pushing back against the corruption devouring you from within. Inch by inch. You rest back control of your overwhelmed senses. And in that heroic instant before your soul dissolves fully, you glimpse the truth. Power urged without compassion enslaves all it touches. Only now, at the edge of oblivion, do you understand how far astray you have fallen? With renewed desperation, you cling to that central light growing steadily stronger as Voldemort's essence recoils from its heat. Back and forth you war wordlessly against the dark tidal wave threatening to annex you entirely. But, where Voldemort draws strength from rage and fear, your only weapon is compassion. For yourself, and even for the maimed, power-twisted soul trying to consume you whole. This unexpected grace erodes the Dark Lord's hold, like acid, allowing your true spirit to space to regain lost ground. Moment by moment the light prevails, seeding no corner of darkness to gain purchase. And then, quite suddenly, you feel Voldemort's fragmented psyche hiss in fury and anguish at this exposure to your inextinguishable inner flame with a howling shriek. His wraith form peels violently away, ejected forcibly from your mind altogether. Gasping, you collapse forward, palms braced against the cold earth. Slowly, a blessed sensation of that parasitic presence scoured from your soul sinks in. With shuddering effort, you raise your head to meet Voldemort's crimson glare where he hovers just outside the glowing ritual circle. You have rejected my essence, but our destinies remain intertwined, my young heir. The Dark Lord snarls. I shall simply seek out a more compliant vessel upon my return. But we shall.
shall meet again. With those ominous parting words, his form rapidly loses cohesion, dissolving into rolling mist before sinking into the earth, leaving only silence behind. Shuddering, you slump down fully, utterly spent. Never have you ventured so close to the abyss of your own dissolution and managed somehow to draw back into the light. For untold minutes, you simply lie shaken, frozen on the ground, feeling life and warmth slowly sleep back into your laden limbs. Lingering horror at your brush with absolute corruption still clings like ice around your heart. But that choosing light remains aglow deep within, kindled anew by your rejection of fear and rage. However terribly you stumbled here at the edge, you ultimately chose compassion, wisdom over destruction, and in so choosing, a fragile redemption took root inside you. At last, you gingerly rise to your feet, swaying slightly as you gather the tainted ritual tools with trembling hands. The night air feels changed, no longer holding restless threat. These objects were meant to channel corrupt power, but you understand at last such magic only enslaves. When you return them to Professor Grey, he will purify them so no other soul falls prey. Turning slowly, you begin the long walk back through the silent forest, still leaning on some nearby trees for support. Your steps feel lighter now, as if an enormous weight has lifted. The shadows barely cling here anymore, and as your breathing evens and the heartbeat slows, a profound certainty grows within you. The faint light still alive in your heart will only grow if you nurture that seed and share its wisdom freely. However long the redemption path ahead, this light can yet transform even your greatest shadows into hopeful new beginnings. Step by determined step, you make your way through the moonlit woods towards Hogwarts distant silhouette, no longer haunted or hurrying, and when the castle's torchlit gates finally loom up before you, all lingering traces of fear and regret fall away at last. Your second chance stands ready. If you choose to walk in light and guide others to find their own. Smiling softly, you pass through the entrance archway and out of the shadows forever. You make your way slowly up to the hospital wing, body and spirit both still heavy with exhaustion but the relief of being free from corruption's grasp fills you with fragile hope. Adam Humphrey clocks in concern over your disheveled, hollowed-eyed state, ushering you directly into a private room and pouring a steaming cup of restorative tonic. Drink up now. No arguments, she tuts waiting until you dutifully drain the bitter draught. Professor Gray sent word you'd likely need care after tonight's ordeal. 
though he gave no details. Her gaze softens as she adds gently, but whatever taunts you will soon set it to rights. You manage a grateful smile. I think the worst has passed now. My own foolishness led me astray, but I'm finding my way back. Madame Pomfrey pats your shoulder. Caring for lost souls is what we're here for. Now rest. The dawn brings a brighter day. With that assurance, she dims the lamps with a wave of her wand and takes her leave. Sleep finds you swiftly in the bed soft haven void of nightmares for the first time in ages. Morning light streaming through the windows gently rouses you. Blinking you see Professor Gray sitting in a chair nearby reading a warm book. He glances up as you stir. Welcome back. How are you feeling? Sitting up slowly you take stock. Your body remains fatigued but your spirit feels unburdened. I'm still weary but the darkness has passed. Your light guided me out of the shadows when I faltered. Grey nods. The light reveals itself to those who seek it, even those long lost in darkness. He smiles slightly. Teaching is why this school exists, to keep hope's flame alight through all seasons and souls. Taking your hand, he continues gravely. I cannot pretend to fathom what you endured last night, but your spirit's strength in turning back from that brink shows the person you truly are, not what dark whispers claimed you must become. You squeeze the professor's hand tightly in wordless gratitude, both for him never abandoning you, and for seeing the goodness lingering beneath your misdeeds. In Gray's steady faith, you feel your own courage and purpose renewed. The past can no longer define your path. In the days that follow, you slowly begin weaving trust anew within your classmates, braced for suspicion or disdain, but most simply welcome you back from your self-imposed isolation without prying offering empathy you feel unworthy of. And when you haltingly confess part of the truth to your gentle friend Myrtle, her forgiveness helps you thaw your heart even further. The darkness in all of us is just pain turned inwards, she says wisely. Yours was simply deeper, but the light still found you. When classes resume after the holiday, you devote yourself to humble acts of service and selfless wisdom that unsplit others rather than control them. Each honest kindness offered freely helps restore faith in the goodness that yet remains inside you. And though the shadows never fully recede, they lose their power to dominate your heart or destiny. You tread onwards in better company who teach you the light still shines if you walk with courage and keep your gaze upwards. The future 
stands ready for you to write openly, unbound by past mistakes. Years later, as you stand proudly among the other graduating students, you know your redemption will continue long after this milestone. Dark magic's allure yet tugs at deep roots within you, requiring constant vigilance. But you have found your true calling, using your gifts to heal and empower, not conquer. And wherever the road ahead now leads, you walk it guided by compassion, not fear or bloodline. This wisdom was brought at great price, but your suffering forged a spirit now wreathed in kindness and unafraid to let your hard-won light shine brightly. Heart unbowed, you step forth boldly into the hopeful dawn, ready to share the redemptive gifts of courage, empathy and grace. With all who need reminding, as others once selflessly did for you.